Welcome to this edition of The Technology Pill, a podcast that looks at how technology is reshaping our lives every day, and exploring the different ways that governments and companies use tech to increase their power. My name is Gus Hossein, and I'm the Executive Director of Privacy International. Oh, and my name is Caitlin Bishop. <laughs> yeah, I, I was wondering, I was, was going to say, should I introduce you? Or, I yeah, forgot this that is... I was a relevant person. Though. My name is Caitlin Bishop, and I'm Privacy International's Campaigns Officer, and I haven't recorded a podcast in about four months. That's not true. A month. I recorded one in December last year. <laughs> and I'm Happy losing New my year. mind. Happy <laughs> exactly. New Year. Exactly. And you're a relevant person. I am a relevant cool. person. <laughs> That's what my mother tells me. <laughs> it's almost Lunar New Year as well. PI's New Year starts in February. It's almost Lunar New Year as we record this. And it is actually now 2022 Gregorian calendar style. So welcome <laughs> to this new Go year. On. To this new 2022 tiger year. Yeah. I wonder what year it is in the Jewish calendar. I used to Question. know these things. 5,782. It's not exactly a round number, but now there is 2022. So that's, that's still, all right. Cool. So this podcast is a revisit somewhat to our new year podcast from last year because we did a podcast in 2021 looking at what we thought was going to happen what our colleagues thought was going to happen and we thought we'd check in with those predictions and see how accurate they were because we like to punish ourselves generally (laughs) yeah because generally we have to keep an eye on where the world is going and try to stem the tide that is against us so when we start predicting things and it sounds really dark it isn't a sense of tragic we must learn to accept these things but rather these are the things we think are going to go wrong unless unless something nice happens And so we can start with uh, possibly the first one, which was our colleague Lucy, who last year said that initial public offerings and financing for biometrics companies are going to grow in 2021. And like, it sucks for a privacy organization to say, hey, yeah, (laughs) this industry that we hate is going to get more money because they're going to be considered a safe investment vehicle. But there's some good news in that, yes, I believe there has been further investment in the surveillance industry. But... Clearview, AI, like probably one of the most infamous biometrics companies because they do facial recognition and um, policing and policing services, they got beat up quite a bit by regulators. Because of us. Like, yeah, yeah. And I know they were actually beaten up by regulators, but we're like, I can't think of a cool way of saying snitches, but we went to all the regulators with all the evidence and said, um, we're pretty sure these guys are breaking the law. And regulators increasingly being saying, oh, yeah, <laughs> they definitely are. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so um, the UK regulator has issued a preliminary fine in the millions of pounds. 17 million pounds. 17 million Tons pounds. The millions. French regulator in December kind of ruined our attempts to quietly shut down the office for the holidays <laughs> by issuing a ruling or a judgment against Clearview as well. So it took us a while, but you know, we did stem a little bit of the tide in the rising financing of biometrics companies. Yes, and there's more kind of coming. And we're hoping that every single person that has invested in what is, we think, very clearly dodgy company and probably at minimum ethically, but almost certainly legally, as many regulators are increasingly agree, lose all their money. Mm-hmm. I hope that that happens. Next one was from our colleague Tom, who said international travel will reopen, but not for everybody. And he highlighted particularly that as much of Africa would unlikely have access to vaccines, the disruption for travelers from Africa would be particularly challenging if we relied on vaccine passports. And listeners to this podcast may remember we ran an edition just on the challenges of travel during a pandemic in 2021, which recounted the countless challenges. What we didn't cover, though, was that it was poor South Africa that decided to alert the world to the detection of a new variant, 
which then overreacting governments, despite the WHO advising otherwise, overreacting governments immediately punished South Africa for identifying this variant and stopped all travel from South Africa. So Tom did not foresee the fact that not only would it be hard for Africans to travel because they don't have the right documentation, because they don't have the right uh, uh, vaccines, because the West was hoarding the vaccines, but also we'll just shut down travel from countries that decide to identify a variant and help the world to identify that variant. And so, yeah, things did not go well for international travel and particularly not for people from the African continent. Yep. And there's still been uh, no TRIPS waiver, which is the waiver for basically the payments for vaccines. So nations can start producing them kind of en masse, you know, in much broader facilities and create easier access. That hasn't happened. Although some of the earliest news from this year, so from 2022, so it doesn't count for a prediction for last year, is that I think it's a university in Texas have developed a, what will be a patent-free vaccine that is slowly getting, starting to get approved. I think it's called Corbivax, which is really exciting. And they hope that it will essentially be open source and it's like a fairly standard vaccine. So kind of lo- lots of facilities that produce other vaccines will be able to produce this one. And it should mean that lots more countries will be able to access it for a lot cheaper. So hopefully this one won't be relevant at the end of 2022, or at least access to vaccines won't be relevant. I don't know about travel. I don't think that one will change all that much because, to be honest, travel, if you bring a lot of African countries to places like the UK, is already quite often a pain in the bum. Tom did a couple more last year one of which was that 1984 last year came out of copyright and he thought that maybe people would take advantage. And I was hoping that there would be a Muppets movie, but no sign yet of anyone really making use of 1984 the way that it should be. Whoa, whoa. You you were hoping there would be a Muppets version of 1984? Absolutely. Like, okay. (laughs) So we all know that Muppets Christmas Carol is the greatest version of Christmas Carol that has ever existed. Without a doubt. Now, expand that out to 1984. It's not that difficult, you know. And you could have a really accurate, in some ways, uh, depiction of 1984, but just, you know, with some Muppets. Can we still have Michael Caine in it? I think you'd have to ask Michael Caine, but I mean, I would vote yes. Okay, he could be the torturer. The one the one human character is the torturer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. We also had a guest from one of our podcasts in 2020 offer a prediction. He wasn't, like, he didn't come on, but he did send us some predictions. Yeah. And he was actually much more positive. Well, he started with some positive (laughs) predictions for 2021 that we harness the increased focus on positive mental health and use this to shift our approaches and attitudes towards what we call severe mental illness. And I'd like to believe that's true. I I think, I, I get the sense that mental health became a much more common point of discussion, whether it was about workplace, around schools, around, well, yeah, I just saw it a lot, but maybe because I'm looking. I don't know. What do you think? No, I think, so I think the reason that David said that is that because of lockdowns, people were talking a lot about the mental health implications, partly because they didn't want lockdowns. So a lot of people that traditionally didn't care about mental health funding had started to talk about mental health. And he was hoping that using that kind of attention, even if it was for slightly superficial or dubious reasons, um, it might help kind of push forward the conversation that does need to be had around people's general mental health and, you know, when it comes to what we call severe mental illness. I don't necessarily think that that's happened in the way that he was hoping. I think it's stayed like a gotcha argument. Like we can't have lockdowns, think about people's mental health, and then people haven't necessarily followed it up with like, yes, Investment. let's think about people's mental health. We should do that. How? Why don't we invest in solutions? Why don't we invest yeah. in helping people? Instead, I think it's stayed more than we would have hoped superficial which kind of sucks, especially given it was one of his hopeful ones. He had some negative ones where he was worried about under-display cameras, although they would make phones much prettier. They would remove the ability for us to understand that covert filming is actually occurring. But these have started emerging, and there's even rumors that future Apple devices will contain this. Yet I've also noticed that the operating system developers have focused on 
notifications of when cameras are on on phones. Hopefully it isn't going to be as disastrous as he was concerned. Yeah, and they've started popping up, but it's been a much slower process, really, than I think he expected. Like, they haven't hit en masse. No. And then uh, our colleague Eva, or ex-colleague Eva, sadly left PI in December for other... Pastures new. Yeah, I, I don't like... It feels inappropriate to say pastures. So I was going down <laughs> that, that phrasing. I thought, maybe no, no. But yeah, and uh, the fact that she left had nothing to do with her prediction for what 2021 would include, which was increasing unionization. So this was either right after or around when Google unionized or Google started unionizing. And she was hoping that that kind of big tech company unionizing would start a wave of unionization. Um, I don't think we've necessarily seen all what could be reasonably described as a wave of unionization across tech organizations. But I do think we've seen a lot more unionization, union kind of sh- struggles or actions and a lot more visibility of unions. And, you know, like I think there's the first Starbucks maybe unionized last year. Time is meaningless. And like lots of different places that haven't traditionally had unions have been unionizing. And at least in the US, there's been a great resignation. Apparently, loads of people have been quitting their jobs for jobs that, you know, treat them less badly and pay them more and all sorts of other reasons. And just have been reevaluating what's important about their jobs and their lives, which is cool. And so I think because of the pandemic in a dark way, not quite for the same reasons as trying to work out this is a good plan to say, but like famously after the plague, the plague marks kind of the end of feudalism and the breaking of the bonds between serfs and their kind of masters, I guess. I can't remember what the word is. Lords. As fewer people, people start moving around, people start kind of looking for better opportunities, less rubbish lords or whatever. I can't remember the details. But anyway, (laughs) scarcity of labor drove cost of labor up. That's not quite the same thing that's happening here like a lot of people have died but it's not really on the same scale as the black pig as far as i know and it's not really the same age groups but there has been this big resignation and there has been a shortage of labor and that has given workers more leverage was what that really long story was just trying to say (laughs) the pandemic (laughs) has given workers more leverage and even where that hasn't resulted in formal unionization it has still resulted i think in people being able to push for better jobs or even as lots of jobs and structures have pushed people into dangerous situations because they can't afford to stay home and there's a pandemic and you know they're pushed into situations where they get ill but i think eva's prediction we can kind of tick like i think she got it broadly right and may she lead the charge out of her future employer Caitlin, you had some Mm -hmm. predictions for Mm -hmm. 2021. What were the ones you think? I made quite a few predictions. So I thought that the rollout of the Indian National Education Plan would be really interesting. But it's actually, I don't know whether it was a fault in my expectations or the actual timeline has changed, but there's been less news there than I thought. Like it's rolled out slightly, or the shiny stuff's rolled out slightly slower than I expected, which in some ways is good because I'm getting to look at it more next year. And in other ways, you know, it means my prediction wasn't as accurate as I was hoping. I thought that the Ugandan election would be really interesting, and it was. It was heavily contested. It was extremely contentious in a way that it hasn't really been in the past. Like it was definitely a lot more dramatic in 2021 than it kind of has been in the past. And I think it caught quite a few people a little bit by surprise because I know we were talking to our partners in Uganda and they were saying it's not really felt like that before. It was different. I was hoping (laughs) and I thought maybe uh, we'd see some environmental law being applied to Bitcoin or kind of Bitcoin being regulated on environmental grounds and some places have started to ban not just Bitcoin I meant cryptocurrency generally cryptocurrency mining some people have started to make noises about cryptocurrency mining regulation you know not it wasn't regulation but because of the almost civil war in Kazakhstan the internet got turned off and like some insane percentage of cryptocurrency mining is in Kazakhstan so that also gave it a massive hit. I didn't see NFTs coming. NFTs took off last year and that was a surprise. I also hoped that there would be more to like last year than there was to 2020, that 
we'd get to the end of the year and we'd be talking about more than COVID. I don't, like, I thought we'd be talking about COVID, but I thought there would be more to the story of last year. And I'm not really sure there was. This time last year, I was talking about COP2021, the big environmental, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. big climate conference. And I had predicted, well, the time, of course I was going to predict that it would be interesting, but I, I took the rare leap that I said that we'd get more leadership from the U.S. than we'd seen in the past. And that was because of the change of presidency, but also just perhaps the focus on innovation might create more opportunity in this space. And we did see that. And so that was an additional story of the year. I think it, it yeah. helped that the world was on fire in, in, over the summer. And yeah. there were a number of emergencies across the world arising from climate. And we will probably forget this, but I, I think the U.S. did play an interesting role at a key moment in the, in the big climate meeting when they came in with a proposal to deal with methane. So I feel a little bit validated there for my prediction, but otherwise it was a bit of a show, unfortunately. <laughs> I don't know how much of that was just like in comparison to the US in the past, because I remember there was a lot of criticism that people were hoping for more. But like at the same time, the US has been so reluctant to get involved at all with the climate emergencies that like, you know, any twinkle of a change felt like a lot more than normal. Exactly. And I think we were able to focus a little bit more on the the role that China played, which is by not showing up. And mm. yet China did make some announcements about when they would go uh, neutral, which I think was 2060. And India managed to blow up a proposal around the use of coal, around minimizing the use of coal, which everybody turned to hate India for a while until they recognized that, well, India is one of those countries that's still heavily reliant on coal. So for them to make a commitment of any form, which they did, even though it'll take a lot longer, is some movement. I'm not saying it's great. Yeah. The other thing I predict is that there would be a bubble in the tech industry and it might start unraveling. I think you said that there already was a bubble in yeah. the tech industry and you thought that 2021 might be the year yeah. it popped. And uh, Apple managed to hit $3 trillion in valuation <laughs> yeah. as a number of other. But I think we are starting to see just in the last few weeks a little bit of movement on that front where as we get a little bit more excited about unlocking, as we get excited about the end of the pandemic, I'm not predicting that. I'm just saying as people get excited about that concept, we're seeing some money being pulled out of the tech industry, which is at least a bit promising. Yeah. I did have this ridiculous statement that I I liked it. I wrote it down because I thought it was poetic. Yeah. We'd stop imagining our screens as the limits of our livelihoods. And for a moment there, particularly around the whistleblowing coming out of Facebook, there was this hope that maybe we would have that. But lo and behold, the Facebook machinery responded by getting all of us to focus on the 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 metaverse. And all of a sudden we're thinking of other screens uh, to focus our attention. More involved in screens. And to be fair, like bubble in the tech industry, then everyone slapped NFTs on the top, which of all of the bubbly pieces of something or other, uh, that one was, an interesting one. Indeed. Is there anything you thought that we really missed? Like anything important that happened that we really missed from 2021? So just in the same way that Black Lives Matters shaped 2020, and that was not foreseeable, but the Tinder was there for such a long time and yet left a a, a slight uncertainty at the end of 2020 as to whether or not real change would occur. I think in going into 2021, particularly with the environment, climate change summit occurring, I I didn't foresee the world would actually be on fire. Mm. And yet while it was happening, I was saying, okay, this this is a gift in the sense that it's horrible and people are losing their lives and their livelihoods and ecosystems are collapsing. But Maybe this will be that moment where we we say we can't have this happen any longer. But that was kind of like Black Lives Matters in 2020. And looking back, that was the, the key thing in 2021, which was the climate. And so in 2022, what disaster, which calamity, <laughs> which horrible things going to have to happen for us to yet again say, oh, gosh, we need systemic change mm-hmm. and maybe struggle to actually do that yet again. That's that's my slight worry. And, and I and I. That's fundamentally my worry for humanity in the next period of time is that we can't have this keep happening. 
which is like something horrible happens and we think, yes, finally people will understand and systemic change is necessary. And, oh, look, metaverse. Yeah. Or, <laughs> you know, and, and, and if we don't provide the systemic change, then people will start to lose hope. And this mm -hmm. is what, where we hear about young people particularly developing this a certain nihilism almost of like, well, look, there's no future anyways. The world is over. So to hell with it all. You don't Climate want that anxiety. to happen to the human psyche. Exactly. You do, you, that's not healthy if we think that it's all going to go to shit, no matter what you do. And I'm sorry, I swore. But like, it's, it's just not healthy. I mean, the one thing that we didn't miss is last year I wrote some horoscopes. And I just wanted to say mine was dead on. My one for me <laughs> was because of Venus. Don't know if that bit was true. Any appliances you own that involve water will be restless in 2021, which turned out to be true. The sink broke. We needed a new boiler. The toilet started dripping water into downstairs. We had to turn the water off while Chris fixed the toilet. Like, literally, I think any appliance we have with water broke at least once. A few needed replacing. Most just needed a swift kick or some fiddling with some screwdrivers, but like, dead on. Um, I'd say that's spooky, but I think I got all the rest wrong. So, you know. Uh, apparently my streaming career was supposed to have flourished with or without my involvement. Fortunately, I don't think I've been across social media or, or across streaming. There Did was you do any streaming this year? No. No, not to my knowledge. So we'll be back very soon with our predictions for 2022. Thank you for listening. If you have any predictions for 2022, you can find us in all the normal places on social media, including Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Mastodon. You can like and subscribe to the podcast on the various platforms you use. It's also available on our website at privacyinternational.org. This podcast is produced by Max Burnell. Music is courtesy of Sepia. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Cool.